and you know, pra praise God, like I'm so glad that many of my non-Christian friends believe deeply in human, universal human rights, believe deeply that racism is wrong, and believe deeply that men and women are equally morally, morally valuable. And yet those claims don't have a real foundation if we, if we rip Christianity out of the picture. Today on Reset, we are going back to the beginning with Rebecca McLaughlin. She is the author of Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Now, I wanted to talk to you about so many different issues. As we go back to the beginning in this series, as we look at whether the ancient origin story of Genesis has something to say to, say to us today, I thought there are lots of, um, there are lots of people who object to Christian faith for any different number of reasons. And you've written a terrific book uh, about it, Confronting Christianity. You've taken head-on 12 challenges. And I want to basically talk around a few of them and uh, get your wisdom on them, especially if we can, if we can bring in Genesis 1 to, 1 to 4, uh, so much the better. But uh, a lot of people, um, first of all, are noticing that we're going through what is a meaning crisis. People are describing it as the story has run out. Um, we, we no longer know our own story. We no longer know why we're here. Um, are there ways that you've noticed that in the West that we've kind of lost our bearings somewhat? The image that's been coming to my mind recently as I've thought about this, and actually particularly as it pertains to morality and the things that we see as obvious moral basics that turn out to have been grounded on, on Christianity and without us really realizing it, it's like when you were a kid and you're watching cartoons and you know how the character it like runs off the cliff mm. and then is running so fast they actually keep on running in midair and then there's that moment where they sort of have this look of horror on their face yes and then they fall down yes so i, I think that we're about here at the moment okay, okay. You, you still think we're level with, with the, the top of the precipice I mean, level well it, it's complex <laughs> it, in some sense it's easy to romanticize the past wherever we're based whether it's the uk the us any, any other sort of part of the world that may historically have been more christian by some measures i think even as i look back at the new testament and see that the kinds of letters that were being written to the first churches i'm like wow Christians have been a mess since the very beginning. So I, I wouldn't want to say there was this idyllic time where actually, you know, for example, all of the West that was supposedly in Christendom was in fact living properly grounded uh, on, on Jesus. So I, to some extent, we, we've won some, we've lost some uh, in terms of how our, our ethics have, have played out. But I, I think we are increasingly needing to face the fact that for a lot of us in the West, and, and I keep saying that because it's a different picture in other parts of the world are running on thin air right now and have not realized that there isn't actually sort of ground beneath our feet even for some of the things that we take to be very basic moral beliefs yeah and i wonder where you would put that that time frame like where where was it that we when did we last have our feet on solid ground because I've, I've interviewed uh, douglas murray and um in his book the madness of crowds he he kind of looked wistfully back to the 1990s um, if I were to talk to a sort of a Catholic social theorist, they would they would look back to sort of before the sexual revolution and before the pill. Um, if you talk to sort of Peter Hitchens, um, he, he would say, well, before the First World War, that's that's really where we ran off a cliff. Um, but, but yeah, where, where did we last have our feet on terra firma? Gosh, that's a complex question. I think there are ways in which some historically Christian norms have been seen as as normative without necessarily properly people understanding that they're they're deeply christian norms so for example there have been times you know not in the far distant past in the west where the assumption was that marriage was between one man and one woman for life and that sex belonged within marriage and that was at least a, a cultural assumption now we all know that many people in particular many men no offense to you and your tribe glenn but many men were finding ways to sort of sneak around Christian marriage, yeah, sure. I think it's easy for us to forget that from the very first, that idea was profoundly countercultural and very 
very weird actually to the, the Greco-Roman ears that first heard this idea that men were meant to be faithful to one woman for the whole of their lives. Hmm. Completely bizarre. I mean, right. almost as almost as bizarre as it sounds to many of our contemporaries now. So I think there have been times when we've been insulated from some of the fallout by Christian norms persisting as at least assumptions in society, even if we're not always living up to them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was talking with a friend recently about uh, the, the progress of sort of moral history. And I think there's an extent to which um, folks who would define themselves as pro progressive or secular want to see history as basically going upwards in terms of, of moral insights. Um, and, and often Christians sort of feel it's the other way. Oh, you know, if we go back to our parents or grandparents or great grandparents generation, so many things were taken for granted that are now not. But then we have to reckon, for example, in the US where I'm based right now with the history of slavery. So, you know, right. sure, there are ways in which most people around me right now don't have a, a Christian understanding of marriage that they may have done a couple of generations ago. But actually, a few generations ago, people were not treating <clears throat> black Americans as if they were in any meaningful sense, human beings with equal value before God. So I, yeah. I, I yeah. would never want to paint a, an overly simplistic picture. And I think always, and this is something that as I read the New Testament, that, that Jesus was very clear, actually Christians should expect mm. that we will, we will always be in a process where even those who define themselves as Christians are often not actually seeking to live as as authentic disciples of jesus right right and yeah and, and I, th I don't think christians sh should be shy of looking at moral progress even in society at large that you yeah. know christians can't you know pat themselves on the back for you know jesus did think that his teaching was like yeast and that mm. the yeast works itself through the batch or he did say it was like a mustard seed that you know grows to become the greatest you know the greatest tree such that even the birds perch in its branches which I think mm. is really interesting because the last time you saw birds in the parables of Jesus he was saying actually Satan was like the bird that was snatching away the word even the mm. opponents of the gospel actually can end up taking shelter in this large thing that you know grows ever more and so yeah well, I think that's something that we see quite clearly at the moment as we discuss in society writ large how people who are in one way or another minority should be treated. And I think it's particularly interesting when, when we look at how um, people who are defined as sexual minorities, be it um, gay, lesbian, bisexual or trans, transgender folk, the force of the moral arguments that are made to say uh, people who identify in those ways should be protected are because of a deep moral assumption that minorities and those who've historically been oppressed ought to be protected and that the, the strong have no right to sort of trample on the weak. Right. And actually that that's a moral insight that came to us from Christianity. Right. So right. It's sort of interesting, we often see Christian assumptions operating on both sides of, of what are seen as sort of cultural debates between, often between Christians and, and secular folk. Yeah, very much so. And he, so Tom Holland brings that out um, very much so in Dominion and, and, and speaks of the Me Too movement, for instance, mm. uh, as betraying a, a radically Christian understanding that, yeah, men should not have their way with women and that they should yeah. not overpower those who are beneath them, which was just taken for granted in the Greco-Roman yeah, world. Yeah. And I think there's a particularly odd tension there that, that many folks today who, who would not consider themselves to be Christians or believers in, in God at all, stake a, a lot of human identity on the history of evolution, like our sort of evolutionary history as, as human beings. And I sort of want to say, well, well, fine, but that then really runs counter to a view that says that it's not okay for men to rape women mm -hmm. or for men, like the, 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 in particular, the sort of sexual dominance that, that you see in much of the animal kingdom shouldn't be okay for humans. Now, for me, it's, it's much less a debate about science and much more a debate about who does God call to be his people. Uh, but I, I would want to say, if you're staking all of your kind of ideological um, land on evolution as the, the best understanding of humans today, like not just sort of biologically, but actually also morally, you end up in some very tricky moral places that, that most people who would want to do that actually would strongly want to distance themselves from Although I find it fascinating, I don't know if you've read um, *Sapiens* by your yeah, yeah, uh, Harari. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, Sapiens, a brief history of humankind. And he does the big sweep of sort of humanity from the beginning, as far as he can piece together everything from sort of biology to history and stares in the face the fact that the conclusion is there are no such things as human rights. Like that's purely a Christian fiction or we have no more natural rights than spiders or chimpanzees or hyenas. And he says these things, they sort of roll off his tongue or on the page. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, I think you're actually spot on. If there is no God, the conclusions you are drawing are entirely correct. Consistent, yeah. But there seems to be no lament and no right. kind of horror mm. at that in the way, I mean, Nietzsche had similar insights, but he was kind of saying, I mean, it's in some sense celebrating the, the shedding of, of the Christian sort of snakeskin, but on the other hand saying, guys, do you not realize, can you not see what's happening, how everything falls like erodes under our feet right. as, soon as, as soon as we say this? I mean, what does he say when... Um, yeah. We give up on Christianity. We pull the right to Christian morality out from under our feet. Nothing necessarily remains in our hands. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I was just I was just reading um, the gay science, or as it's now being translated, the joyous science. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, he says, what what sacred games shall we have to invent now that God is dead? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we not become gods ourselves, if only to appear worthy of it? And I, I thought of Harari <laughs> as mm. I read that, because what's the next book after Sapiens? <laughs> Homodeus. <Yeah. laughs> like, yeah. Must yeah. we not become gods to become right. worthy of this? Um, right. Yeah, we do, apparently. <laughs> and even though the, the, the idea that, that God is dead, as, as Nietzsche so um, naturally put it, which is so much part of the drinking water, at least in many of the circles in which I've historically we sort of assume that clearly within a couple of generations a religious belief will be nothing more than a relic really i mean that, that's been the the assumption of many in the kind of intellectual west for as long as i've been alive hmm. except those who are actually tracking what's happening globally hmm. who have said okay guys unfortunately or either fortunately or unfortunately depending on your perspective those who who are prophesying the global decline of religion in light of global modernization and you know high levels of education and more scientific understanding etc 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 those prophecies have failed big time yeah. and in fact ironically the reason that many of my friends and potentially many of your friends think that christianity is declining globally and the belief in god in general is sort of very much a, a historic phenomenon that's that's uh, withering in, in the light of 21st century knowledge that is a profoundly white Western parochial view. Hmm. It's just not what's happening in, in the rest of the world. Hmm. Hmm. Tell me, tell me what, what is happening in the rest of the world? Because we, we live in a weird culture. I love the, the acronym, you know, white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic. We're weird. We're the weird ones. Oh, I've never heard that. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so we've, we in the West have, this, have these weird views. But what, what is happening in the two thirds world? What's, what's, what's happening elsewhere? Uh, as as the the church goes forward, yeah, it seems like as sociologists are looking to about twenty sixty, so forty odd years from now, that Christianity is likely to remain the largest global belief system. So currently, about thirty one percent of the world identifies as Christian, though um, you know clearly that doesn't necessarily mean they are authentic followers of, of Jesus, but would certainly, if you gave them a, a census form, would would um, check the box for Christian, and that proportion is set to increase slightly to 32% by 2060. The proportion of folks who would identify as Muslim is set to increase significantly from around 24% to 31%, making it a very close competitor with Christianity. Um, Buddhists, are, uh, Hindus are about 15%, Buddhists about 7%, both expected to decline slightly. And the proportion of people who don't identify with any religious tradition, be they atheists, agnostics, or just people who would check none on a census form, is set to decline from 16% to 13%. Decline. Yeah. Decline. This is news for people, right? This is, it, it's kind of, it's the most shocking form of news in a way, because in, in the West, among the, the weird folk, as you say, yeah. among the sort of the white uh, educated, um, what was it? Industrialized, rich, democratic. It, yep. Thank societies. you. Mm. Uh, the proportion of folks identifying as not religious is increasing dramatically. 
uh, it, it's still actually small compared to the proportion who identify as religious in, in many, or at least it, you know, in, in the US. And that's partly because, um, again, looking in, in America, you have uh, black Americans who are about 10 percentage points more likely to identify as Christians than, than whites and actually score higher on any measure of Christian commitment, be it weekly church attendance or Bible reading or prayer or however you want to define it. Um, that you have uh, Latino and Latino Americans who are also significantly more likely to identify as Christians. Okay, so you, you essentially, you have the, the effect of um, immigration uh, today bolstering the church in America, which again is ironic because so many white American Christians think immigration is sort of eroding America's Christian identity. Hmm. Um, and you also have, so, so part of the story, both in the West and, and globally, is that people who believe in God have more kids than those who don't. Loads and the birth rates in, in both the US and the UK at the moment are historic. 1.7. They just came out saying 1.7 in the UK. And I, I yeah, that's where be, we are in the US. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I happen to be talking um, to somebody about sort of Nigeria because I was talking about, you know, I'm an Anglican and, you know, the, the median Anglican is a 20 something Nigerian woman. And so as, as we were talking about birth rates, I just looked up Nigerian birth rate 5.5, you know. Yeah. Yeah. as opposed to us, 1.7. Well, and that's, so, so that's part of what's happening. It's a good part of what's happening, both both globally and, and actually locally. I mean, even within the US or within the UK, people who believe in God have more kids than those who don't, significantly. But that's not the whole story. I mean, in some ways, my, my secular friends would feel reassured if that were the whole story. You know, sure, like these religious people just have tons of children and so they sort of outbreed us rather than ever outthinking us. Yeah, but from their Darwinian point of view, you should say, well, well <laughs> surely they're playing the survival game better. So if they're right, pure Darwinists, right. but anyway, anyway. Yeah. But, but what's fascinating is if we look at China, the largest country in the world and one which now has a, a, an explicitly atheist mm. government, uh, the church in China is growing so fast that in the next five years, there'll be more Christians in China than in America. And some experts think that by 2060, China could be a majority Christian country. Hmm. So, so that is a space where it's actually not about who's breeding faster. Mm, it's yeah. it's about the fact that communism as, a, as an ideology, I sometimes like to talk about communism, it's like, it's like a Christian heresy. It's sort of trying to get some hmm. of the good of Christian ethics without like ripping out the heart of, of hmm. belief in a creator God and, and of, yeah. of Jesus um, and also not taking seriously what the Bible says about human nature, yeah. but nonetheless trying to uh, construct a world in which human beings are genuinely considered to be equal. Totally. So it, it's interesting, I mean, communism, unlike fascism, has at its heart a sort of beautiful seed, but actually has grown into a horrible Mm. Uh, withering um, vines all over the place. And have have least... you heard Slavoj Žižek talk about sort of Christian atheism? And, and you know, he, he speaks in, in these very grand terms and you, you're never quite sure um, how much he means this. But he sort of says, you know, the Protestant reformers were wonderful. They were sort of the first communists in that they, they thought that it's not that God sort of rescues you out of the world. It's that God comes down and dies and he remains yeah. dead. And then the resurrection really is the spirit <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Whoa, hang I, on. Say, I missed that. I missed that. I, memory. I missed that in Luther when I think, like, yeah. where is that in the Institute? But uh, God remains dead. And the spirits in the community um, kind of is, is formed on, uh, on this sort of equal basis and, and on it goes. And so, yeah, he he, you know, very much wants to see communism as as a hyper Protestantism in, in one sense. Um, I, I think he's I think he takes a few missteps along the way. But yeah, there's, maybe something just profoundly, <laughs> there's something profoundly Christian about holding every, everything in common. Um, and it was, it was so threatening to the Church of England that, you know, written into the 39 Articles, <laughs> there has to be this, this article that says goods are not to be held in common. Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of reformers were absolutely kind of going down. Yeah, I mean, it's route. very much what seems to have been happening in the, the very beginnings of the, the Christian movement. Yeah. Um, I think... Uh, Again, I think one of the big mistakes that communism makes is not accounting for human nature, which the Bible does account for. And so, so many provisions need to be made for how do we stop people turning everything to sin? Right. Um, and if if you construct, you know, as we see in basically every communist country, if you construct a system where everybody's equal, but actually only a few people are in power, <laughs> mm. you, you then create things that are, look remarkably like what fascism looks like. Yes. Uh, yeah. just under a different name yeah, yeah. but yeah i mean the, the, just going back to the the global picture at the moment the the story of china and how how things are going to play out in china in the next few decades is the most important question 
Um, and there seems, as they say, significant hope that actually a wave of dissolution or a continued wave of disillusionment with communism is, is sweeping through China and that people are turning to Jesus as the one who actually delivers, delivers on the best promises of communism mm -hmm. uh, while also um, pulling us back from, from the, the horrors that, that communism drags people into. Mm. Uh, but I think we also need to take seriously, I mean, you know, it, it can be reassuring to hear, well, Christians uh, are not going to lose their sort of global market share in, in your or my lifetime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the fact that Islam is becoming a very close competitor with Christianity <clears throat> is, is, is important. And I think it's something that folks like us who are based in the West can easily either ignore or, or miss understand mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it speaks partly to the fact that you know both Christianity and Islam offer a, a big and powerful vision of how you and I as little humans fit into a much bigger story and I, I think that uh, they're both compelling stories I happen to believe that Christianity is, is true and that Islam is on many points profoundly wrong but I think we need to recognize that, that Islam at a global level is, is the other sort of big mm. idea in, in the world right now. And you could right. say, I mean, the, the, the next religion down in terms of proportions is, is Hinduism, mm. but almost exclusively in India, um, some in Nepal. But, you know, I, either folks who live in India or who have um, emigrated from mm. India. So a sort of much more contained phenomenon, mm. whereas Christianity is by far the most diverse belief system in the world, yes. which is sort of evenly spread between yes. Europe and Latin America and um, Africa uh, and grow, you know, growing population in, in Asia. Yeah. And interestingly as well, uh, and I'll shut up after this, Christianity has always been a majority female movement. Mm. Again, no offense to you and I you know, love my, <laughs> right. brothers, my brothers in Christ, but it seems like from <laughs> the very beginning in the Greco-Roman world, could have been as much as two thirds male due to a combination of women dying in childbirth and people leaving baby girls out to die. Mm -hmm. And yet the church in about the second century seems to have been as much as two thirds female. Mm -hmm. And we see even today, if you look globally, it's, it's, and it's not just that, well, women are more religious than men. Actually, if you compare Christianity to Islam, it's Christianity that has the big differential between men and women, mm -hmm. not, not Islam. Right. Right, that's interesting. So, th so there are a lot of caricatures about the the state of play of Christianity in the world today, and one is to mm. say that it's on the wane. And one answer to that is, well, I guess among white people, you could you 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 could make that argument. I think, but another thing that that I think is wrong with the caricature is we had imagined that having jettisoned our Christian past, we would become ever more rational. Mm. Um, and it would be rationality that would be the, the triumph over, you know, these benighted Christian views. Whereas I, I think we're, we're recognizing that we, we don't become more rational. We become more religious just in, in a different sense. You know, mm. we, we, uh, it, it, it is not that, our, our, you know, that we orbit around our brains now. Um, we, we are still very much heart-led creatures who still have, yeah. you know, huge doctrines. And, you know, there, there is now, you know, excommunication for the wrong, for the wrong faith claims. And, mm -hmm. you know, Dostoevsky said, you know, when, when there is no God, everything is permitted. I think, no, when everything, when there is no God, then everything, everything becomes really preachy, <laughs> like incredibly <laughs> preachy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I think, modern people have have that wrong as well that that actually we've we've walked away from religion into rationality and i think if you look at the culture we haven't walked towards greater rationality at all yeah and, and i think for me that comes back to the running off the cliff metaphor because hmm. in order to truly ground some of the beliefs that today you know, my, my secular friends would see as just like basic incontrovertible truths like for example, that racism is wrong. Now, I believe that racism is wrong because I am a Christian. Right. If I, if I rip God out of the heart of, of my beliefs, there's actually no particular reason for me not to say, well, actually, folks from my tribe, and, you know, one way that I can kind of approximate that as, like, folks who look like me racially or have the same sort of cultural background that I do, however you want to define it, mm 
no particular reason for me to say I should be willing to have e an equal understanding or like, like lay down my my what I could claim as my power or rights in any situation for the sake of those who, who have less power for whatever reason, whether it's because they're poor or because they're disabled or because they've been historically oppressed. Like there's no particular reason why I should do that if I have more power than other folks. Mm. And, and so there, there are these, um, and you know, pra praise God, like I'm so glad that many of my non-Christian friends believe deeply in human, universal human rights, believe deeply that racism is wrong, and believe deeply that men and women are equally morally, morally valuable. And yet those claims don't have a real foundation if we, if we rip Christianity out of the picture. And I think that's partly why a lot of conversations just devolve into outrage. Because if I can't argue for my position, if actually my worldview doesn't properly ground my belief that racism is wrong, for example, then all I can do if you say something that, that challenges that is shout at you. I, I, I actually don't have the, the argumentative resources to, to back it up or, or I see this playing out a lot in, in conversations around um, sexuality and, and sexual minorities of, of various kinds, that there's this, this quick movement toward outrage, partly because people feel like, you know, folks are being legitimately oppressed and, and they, they want to defend, but partly because there, there isn't this this strong foundation, um, this sort of deep well to draw on. Mm. Yeah. And in those conversations, there's also this profound irony that the, the, the views that are being decried as utterly abhorrent by many sort of white Westerners today are views that are held by many folks outside the white Western bubble. Mm. If you think about the backlash that JK Rowling had for, um, making a pretty modest claim actually for the fact that biological women should in some circumstances be treated differently than transgender women right uh the the kind of outrage and and, and vitriol that's been leveled at her for saying that hmm. it is partly perplexing because i don't think those folks w would want to use that language that same language against all the black women mm -hmm. globally who believe actually more can more sort of you could say conservative things than, than jk rowling does sure so there's a sort of odd yeah there's yeah. this odd tangling up in our in in our minds of different kinds of diversity where we sort of want to say you know over here is the folks who believe in in racial justice and um in equality and uh, protection of women and in equality of um lgbt folks and over here are the sort of e evil guys and girls who don't actually the, the, those are very importantly different kinds of diversity that need to be thought about very differently and, and that actually the bible points us in very different ways um, on so yes, yeah there's yes. a lot of complexity there yeah i mean mark sayers talks about uh, you know modern secular society we want the kingdom without the king mm. and one of the things that means is that the kingdom without the king is like a playground without a teacher on duty mm. um and and then yeah who rules the playground well the loudest strongest bully you know, mm. rules the playground. And so there's that dynamic going on. But I think there's also something that's testimony to how Christian we are in that we do know that the victim should be protected. Yeah. And sometimes it's a race to the bottom to see who can be the victim, not who can mm. protect the victim, but who can be the victim. Um, and, and this sort of, yeah, com competitive oppress, uh, you know, competitive victimhood kind of goes on at that stage as well. So we, we, we don't really know how to weigh these things up um, in the absence of the king. Yeah, and I think part of it as well, honestly, is that we Christians haven't been living with Jesus our king in a lot, lot of ways too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, I was asked a question, I gave a talk at MIT back in January, and a question came afterwards. Um, why have Christians been acted hatefully toward LGBT folk? And I said, there's one answer to that question, sin. Mm. Like actually that, <clears throat> I would want to differentiate, as it's profoundly important that we differentiate between uh, disagreeing with somebody's choices and acting hatefully towards them. But it is absolutely the case that Christians are <clears throat> in many instances and times acted hatefully toward LGBT folk. And that's sin. I mean, if Jesus calls us to love even our enemies, then we absolutely should be loving people who have made different choices about their, their lives that, than we have. 
right. and have different lived experience than we do, especially if they're not Christians. Uh, I mean, the, the idea that we should expect non-believers to live according to Christian ethics, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't see that in the scriptures. Uh, you know, God, God will judge all of us at the end, but, but from our perspective, there seems to be a pretty clear um, division for Christians between how you should approach uh, a brother or sister who is um, unrepentantly engaging in things that the Bible calls sin and how you should approach a, a non-believer. Um, and really for, for the non-believer, 90% of what we need to be doing is preaching Jesus to them. Right. Um, it, it, if they submit their lives to him, there's so much that follows from that. But I think there's been, there's been so sin around that in the church and, and especially when it comes to race, there's very, there's been such, blatant sin and continues to, in many sectors to be such blatant sin mm -hmm. um when it comes to racism that i don't know it's, it's it's easy and tempting for us almost to sort of point the finger out there and say well all these all these things are happening out there in the world and you know the church has to kind of uh, stand against that well yes and no i think often the the evil is sprouted up amongst us and one of the most important things we need to do is repent Mm, mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's let's pick on those two um, sort of issues, sort of race and sex, and perhaps go back to the beginning and see um, what does the Adam story, what is the Eden story, what is, what does Genesis one to four have to say? First of all, on on the issue of race, what well, what would you say, Rebecca? Paint 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 a, a big picture for us on a, on this cosmic canvas that we've got here. Yeah, I, I think it. I, I just finished writing a, a kid's book, sort of translating some of the ideas of my grown-up book into, you know, 10 questions for kids to grapple with. And afterwards, I thought, gosh, I so often came back to, I believe it's Genesis 127, where God says, let us make man in our own image. And he says, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Mm -hmm. So this, this foundational belief that the Bible gives us, that, that every human being is made in God's image, and it's one of the wonderfully kind of puzzling things the Bible gives us mm. as, as we, we gradually sort of see different angles on what that means through the scriptures. And then we see in Jesus, the, the perfect image of the invisible God, you know, shows us properly what that means. But we see from the very beginning that, that every human being is made in the image of God. And that, that applies to male and female and it applies to, it's not like God didn't say, let us create this particular kind of human in our own image he, he, it's all humanity is, is made in god's image right. so, we, so we have that first building block mm. um, from genesis one mm. and and i think that is is so important in conversations about race i don't think it gives us all of the answers we need because we also need i think to go you know, through through the old testament through the the gospels and jesus is breaking across every racial and cultural barrier of his day and then commanding his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. And then we see in Revelation this vision of people from every tribe and tongue and nation worshiping Jesus together. So I think we, we see we have this big vision that unfolds throughout the scriptures. Mm -hmm. But the, the seeds are planted in Genesis 1 and God makes all humanity mm -hmm. in his image. Mm -hmm. And, and any, any time we are asking questions about how somebody should relate to another human across any kind of barrier of difference, we need to have as our starting point well this other person is also made in god's image and i need mm. to treat them that way um rather than i mean the the idea of one human being able to like actually own another human uh in a sort of manner of uh, mm. chattel slavery it, one of the most profoundly wrong things about that is actually it, god owns that person not you right there's no mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it, you're 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 putting yourself in god's place to claim that you own another human being right right and you've got a, you've got a chapter about that uh, about the slavery issue in in your book as well um but i wonder if we got rid of genesis 126 and the, the image of gods on all mm. people what would that then do for for how we consider the races because i, I think you know it's only 100 years ago that scientific racism was um pretty um respectable in so many senses you know and people noticing differences and you know and in the classical world if if a plato or an aristotle noticed you know a, the, there's a slave and there's a free man 
And of course, the free man is a different kind of human to the slave. Mm -hmm. And does not nature mm -hmm. teach you that some are born to be living tools? Well, well, of course. Yeah. And, and of course, this person is stronger and more economically valuable. And this person, you know, is better looking and all these sorts of things. Like when we look at different human beings, what we see are differences. Where do mm -hmm. we get this idea that people are equal? It's, it's, it's almost a magical belief, unless it's grounded in Genesis. Yeah, I, I think, of course, many of the things that people have appealed to scientifically have actually been scientifically invalid. Um, mm. So there, there, there was a lot of effort put into trying to find meaningful <clears throat> biological differences between black people and white people, for example, mm. particularly in the last few centuries. Um, and that that well has, has come up dry uh, in terms of like real significant biological differences. Now, there are real significant bi biological differences between you and me because you're a man and I'm a woman, and that's actually written into our DNA, like in every cell of our body is, is, is gonna be telling that story of difference. Um, but, but so part of it has been poor science um, and, and science that's sort of been grounded on um, cultural assumptions about who, who's better than whom. Mm. I think if, if we play the mental experiment of, you know, imagine we didn't have the testimony of Genesis one, well, we actually have the testimony of the whole of the rest of the scriptures and, and one of the things that fascinates me um as i as i read through the scriptures and trying to sort of notice this more and more is how easy it is to think that the bible was basically written by white people for white people <laughs> and that any anyone else who sort of comes in is doing so um you know sort of on the sidelines and then that's sadly that's a belief that's been tacitly held by a lot of white christians as well as tacitly held by a lot of folks who've rejected christianity for that reason mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at the Bible, I mean, first off, we're talking about like that. I don't think there's a single white person who wrote a word of the Bible. Like this is this is Jewish folk living in the Middle East whose skin would have likely been far browner than yours or mine. Hmm. Um, and we see I, I love even in the Exodus narrative how God's people come out of Egypt and a mixed multitude comes with them hmm. that you see all through the Old Testament, people of different tribes and tongues and nations sort of being woven into God's people in interesting ways. And then you see in the New Testament, even at, at Pentecost, when um, Peter is preaching to the crowds, the text sort of specifically references some of the different people who were there, and, and they, they represent a, a vast range, um, you know, folks from Turkey and uh, Iran, and as well as, um, you know, from Egypt and Libya. And like, so we've sort of got Middle Easterns, we've got Africans, we've got Europeans, we've got like a whole mishmash of, hmm. of folk there. Um, we see the first individual African Christian's testimony in the book of Acts, the hmm. Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter eight. Uh, he was interestingly a very educated man sitting there reading the scroll of Isaiah when Philip runs up to him to tell him about Jesus and how he you know, immediately becomes a Christian. Uh, and so we, we kind of have this, this like white out view often of the scriptures that doesn't represent what they are. And so we sort of start, even as we approach this question, we start with an assumption of, of white Western privilege. When if anybody is kind of looking in around the edges, right. you could say that it's, it's us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we kind of need to decenter that somewhat, even as we approach the scriptures and um, maybe sometimes translate words to their modern locations, like ancient locations, the modern ones. So we sort of, see things mm -hmm. with those eyes more, right, more readily. Right, right. And then if we read the story on to the end, we get every tribe, nation, people and tongue um, yeah. gathered together, which is it's, it's just it's a constant source of astonishment to me that racial identities do continue, you know, in the resurrection, mm -hmm. that that's um, they are they are not steamrolled or they, they are not you know kind of boiled together in a pot so that we're all just the, the, the same kind of gray color um yeah it's yeah. interesting my, my husband a couple of weeks ago had a, a surgery to where now his um his belly looks like he's got three stab wounds wow um it's kind of horrible what did you but do? i was saying to the other, well, it wasn't my fault i promise <laughs> i was saying to him the other day oh it's almost like you know how the risen jesus has the wounds in his hands and in his side. Um, and because they use surgical glue on my husband, sorry to be gruesome, but like they, they sort of just look like fresh stab wounds in, in many ways. And, and we see Jesus is the only kind of current example we have of what, what a resurrection body looks like. And it seems like it's in many ways continuous mm. with how he looked previously, 
but also in some ways importantly different to where he often wasn't immediately recognized and he can kind of do some mm. like crazy sort of magical things even more than he could before it seems um so it, it it isn't surprising that you and i will be white in the new creation and that um my ethiopian friend will be black in the new creation what is surprising is that there's no marriage mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so again that shouldn't be surprising if we listen to the whole big story of the scriptures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that will bring us on to sex and marriage, because here, here is another great defeat of a Christian belief. Surely, um, you can't believe in the Bible. It's misogynistic and it's homophobic. What do you say? First, looking at the question of misogyny, it's, it is curious to me when people make that claim that Christians have always been majority female, or should I say the, the church has always been majority female since the beginning and actually even today I mean, it seems like the church in china is, is also majority female kind of in line with historic norms so it, it's curious that that would be the case if christianity is is at heart misogynistic uh it's also curious because when we look at the history of ideas jesus's treatment of women elevated them in in a way that was at the time quite extraordinary and we see that again you know we talked a few minutes ago about jesus breaking through racial and cultural barriers he also consistently broke through gender barriers uh, and one of the most shocking things he did was have this this life-changing conversation with a, a samaritan woman hmm. of ill repute hmm. so sort of combining like the samaritans were the folks who the jews hated racially and ethnically uh, she was a woman he was a, a jewish rabbi and she was a woman with a sort of a curious sexual past uh, and she herself is shocked that he's talking to her. Um, but but consistently through the Gospels, you see Jesus actually elevating women. It's particularly interesting if you if you read through Luke's Gospel, where you have men and women consistently paralleled from from the very beginning. Uh, you'll see an angel appearing to Zechariah, uh, a man, and then the same angel appearing to Mary, Jesus's mother. Um, and Mary comes off much better from this encounter than Zechariah does. As she's commanded, he loses his voice. Um, you see this sort of pattern throughout the, the, the gospel. Uh, you see Jesus, um, for example, holding up a, 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 a sinful woman as a moral example to a self-righteous man. Hmm. Uh, you see him uh, validating Mary, so Mary and Martha, two sisters, Jesus uh, at their house, it seems, uh, Martha playing the, the traditionally female role of, of hosting and getting the food ready and stuff and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet with the male disciples. Martha says, Jesus, come on, like, can't you tell her off? She should be helping me. And Jesus says, no, Mary's chosen the better portion and I'm not going to take that away from her. So Jesus sort of validating a, a female disciple like that. Uh, and you see it through to the fact that in all of the Gospels, it was the women who witnessed the resurrection. Mm. Um, and, and even when they came back and told the guys, hey, this has happened, there was sort of skepticism mm. uh, from, from the male disciples. So you see through the Gospels this, this extraordinary elevation of women. And then you see, um, it's, it's fascinating as we look at uh, Paul's teaching, um, in, for example, in the letter to the Ephesians, where in chapter five, he talks about marriage as being like a, a metaphor to help us understand Jesus's relationship with his church. And this is one of the places where people will point and say, well, you know, this proves that, that Christianity is misogynistic because, because Paul says, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. But the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And we read that with sort of 21st century ears and we think, oh, like completely shocking, awful. Wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, what we don't hear is that the second part of that, which is where Paul says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Mm. And the, the idea that a wife should submit to her husband would have been perfectly commonplace in the, the culture um, to which Paul was writing. The idea that a husband should give himself up for his wife like Jesus dying on the cross for his people is completely countercultural then and, and also actually kind of shocking now. Like even I sometimes have done the thought experiment, like imagine that text would, were flipped around. And it said, wives, give yourselves up for your husbands, like mm. Jesus dying on the cross. Mm. That's the call to husbands. So we tend to, we often come to scriptures with, with our own sort of preconceptions and, and with the basic idea that, that we should probably be in a privileged position. 
So if I, as a woman, read that text and I think, wife, submit to your husbands, I don't think so. Like, who says I should submit to anybody? Um, a man might come to that text and say, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Like, you know, husbands love your wives to the point of death. Hmm. That doesn't sound great either. But actually, one of the, the basic principles of, of, of Christianity that Jesus himself modeled was that anyone who wants to be a leader must be a servant. And that even he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Hmm. So, so we see even in that sort of highly controversial passage, a, a vision of, um, of submission on the one hand and sacrifice on the other to where rather than it putting men above women, as was always historically the case, it actually puts them on a very equal footing just with, with different callings because Jesus, it, it, the, the husband is modeling Jesus's love for his church and, and the wife is modeling the church's um, responsive submission to, to Jesus. Uh, and we don't realize how radical even the, the basics of Christian um, sexual ethics were in the first century, where rather than women being kind of sexually disposable and men having complete sexual freedom to where, you know, a free Roman man could quite, without anyone thinking much of it, sleep with either male or female slaves, sleep with women he wasn't married to, sleep with men he wasn't married to, so long as, I mean, there was sort of power dynamics at, at, at play there. Um, but the, the idea that actually no, any husband must be purely faithful to his one wife hmm. um, provided a level of sort of equality and protection that the women had never enjoyed. And, and honestly, that women don't enjoy today. I mean, hmm. this is one of the tragedies of the sexual revolution is it's sort of sold to us as the liberation of women. And actually, even if you just look like set all faith presuppositions aside, if you just look at the data, for women, having multiple sexual partners is correlated with lower levels of happiness and high levels of depression and um, suicidal ideation and, and susceptibility to drug abuse and alcoholism, etc. Like it's actually not a good. Like it's it's not for our good. In right. if if you look at um, you know what the, the data suggests. And the mirror so, image of that is when you go back to Matthew 19 and Jesus actually, you know, explicates this sort of vision for sex and marriage. And there are some red-blooded men there, you know, fishermen and the likes. And and they think to themselves, if that's what marriage is, count us out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because they're being called to they're being called to discipline um, themselves in in ways that really no one else had ever called them to. Um, yeah, yeah. And what's what's curious as well to me is you know, in sort of transitioning to the the conversation about marriage and about about sex itself, is that actually. I think part of what we have, uh, we Christians have misfired on uh, when it comes to today's conversations about, you know, where, where does sex belong and, and what sexual intimacy should look like, is that, that we've bought into the idea that the only real kind of intimacy there is, is sexual intimacy. And so anybody who isn't able to participate in that, it's like, you know, sending them off to a barren wasteland of loneliness. And in many ways in our culture, that is how things play out for people. But, but that's because we're not being sufficiently biblical as we think about how folks in the church should relate to each other. I mean, the, the incredibly intimate language that Paul, as a, as a single man, uses to describe his love for the churches that he writes to. You know, he'll, he said to the Thessalonians, he was among them like a nursing mother with her children. Like an, mm. like an embarrassingly intimate image there of like, breastfeeding. Um, or he, he calls... Christians, you know, one body, he says we're comrades in arms. Um, he calls his, his friend Onesimus, who is a runaway slave, his very heart. Mm. Things like this, which, again, honestly, the average kind of Christian man today would be embarrassed to say to <laughs> a, a close Christian friend or about a close Christian male friend. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've, we've done both within the church and outside, but I'll, I'll speak for within the church to start with, is we've collapsed real intimacy into this idea of sexual intimacy. And, and we, we talk and act as if that's the only place that real intimacy happens. And that's actually a profoundly unbiblical way of thinking. If we look at what Paul says, uh, he talks about being among the Thessalonians, a church he was writing to, like a nursing mother with her children, like an embarrassingly intimate picture of, of breastfeeding uh, as, a, as a, a picture for how he was relating to them. Or he calls his, his friend Anisimus a, a runaway slave, his, his very heart. And he, he calls Christians to live as, as brothers and sisters. He says that we're one body. He says we're comrades in arms. He says we're knit together in love. Like all of this deeply intimate language 
that it is is not sexual but is is profoundly uh, close mm. and i i think th the church needs to be a place where where those things mean something and, and where it's not just about defending the kind of nuclear family as uh, you know the, the height of, of christian ethics um and at the same time I, I think we need to have a much bigger vision of of what Christian marriage is. So, so what I've said then could have made it sound like, well, Christian marriage is sort of just a small piece of a much bigger picture, which it is, but it's actually also a small picture of a much bigger, more beautiful picture. Um, <clears throat> the way I sometimes think about this is that you know, back in the day, I'm sure you remember, Glenn, when if you wanted to have a photograph developed, like you, you, you took your photograph on your camera mm -hmm. and then you took out the negatives, the little black and white uh, sort of minis, and you took them over to some shop that was going to develop them for you into this beautiful color picture. Mm -hmm. And what, what we've often done in conversations about sexual ethics as Christians is we, we've only presented the negative. We've said, here's what Christians can't do. Mm. And here's what we know. We don't think other people should be doing either. Mm. Uh, it's like you're sort of holding up this little black and white thing and trying to look through it, see what the picture is there. In fact, the, the Bible gives us this beautifully developed picture of God's relationship with his people, Jesus' relationship with his church, as being like a husband's relationship with his wife, or, or rather the, the, the other way around, that just as the Bible says, it gives us fatherhood as a, as a picture, a little lived metaphor mm. of how God loves us. And, and just as the Bible actually also gives us motherhood uh, as, a, as a little picture of how God loves us. So also the Bible gives us, uh, you know, throughout the prophets and into the, new, uh, into the gospels and into the book of Revelation, this picture of God and his people as a, as a faithful, loving husband, and in the Old Testament, Israel as an often unfaithful wife. And that's, that's the underlying point of what Paul is saying in, in Ephesians 5. He's, towards the end, he sort of has this funny moment where he says, oh, look, what I'm really talking about here is Christ and the church. Like, right. sure, like marriage, all important, but it's only really important because it's pointed to this, this much better thing. Right. And, right. and in, in the book of Revelation, we see this massive announcement that the wedding of the lamb has come referring to jesus and and jesus is married to his church bringing heaven and earth back together right so at its very best from a christian perspective human marriage is a tiny little picture of, of a much greater reality and, and because we haven't consistently sort of taught that we've left both married people and single people in a really tough spot because to marry people we, we've bought into this idea that one other human being should be able to fulfill you in every way rather than saying this this marriage you're in is meant to be appointed to a much better thing mm. and and we've said to single people oh well i'm terribly sorry if you're not married you're missing out on the best thing mm. Where, which is actually crushing to them as well rather than saying maybe you'll miss out on marriage in this life but actually if you're trusting in jesus you will not miss out on the much much better thing mm. to which marriage was only like a tiny trailer at best mm. Mm. And I think I think we need to keep that central in any conversations about gender or sexuality, actually, to say you know, what if we believe that God created the universe, going back to Genesis one. Then he made all of these things intentionally. And the Bible tells us he made these things, all of these things to point us to him. So let's look at what the Bible says. And we find that that Christian sexual ethics are actually a lot weirder than anybody would have realized, because it's not just like randomly don't do these things it's oh i'm participating in a little scale model of the most amazing thing in the history of the, the world. cosmic romance yes Indeed. participating somehow or testifying to the cosmic romance you know yeah. genesis 1 in the beginning god made the heavens and the earth heavens masculine earth feminine works in hebrew works in greek works in, works mm -hmm. in all the romance languages i do think you're meant to be looking at heaven and earth and thinking those two should get together mm -hmm. you know and and then by the end of chapter one you've got adam and eve as these icons of heaven and earth um, and they are called to get together, to be fruitful and multiply. And then, you know, in, in the Old Testament, you've got, you know, God and Israel, and you've got Christ and the church. And then you get to the end of Revelation, and you get heaven actually marrying earth. And, mm. yeah, that, that, is the, that is the oil painting. And wh whatever human relationships we have, the, the best they can be is pencil sketches um, mm. to, to point people to that. Mm. But if we keep our eyes off the off the the portrait, none none of this makes sense, does it? Yeah, yeah, it really doesn't. Um, so, someone listening into this, Rebecca, final question. Someone listening into this thinks, okay, yeah, maybe not convinced, um, but I'm I'm willing to investigate. Um, what advice would you give them? <laughs> 
I would say sit down and read, let's say, Luke's gospel. Mm -hmm. I'm reading it at the moment, actually, rereading it because it's it's so stunning. And it, it's easy, I think, both for Christians and for, for folks who wouldn't consider themselves to be Christians, to, to come to the Bible expecting it to be very Sunday school, like very uh, simple in a way. And actually, from the very beginning of Genesis, the, the Bible, it is clear but highly um i don't know if complex is quite the word but it you know how the best Textured. stories and the best films mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. invite us to figure things out mm -hmm. like actually call us to, to lean in and, oh wait wait what's going on here mm -hmm. oh what does this mean that, that was consistently how jesus taught in metaphors and parables that would make you think okay I, i've got to figure out what, what's happening here so i would say sit down with any of the gospels but like i say, i'm reading luke myself right now read through it with a bit of an open mind and think who who could this person be what is this story that that's being told um don't get don't get tripped up by i mean i mentioned earlier at the beginning of luke's gospel you have angel gabriel appearing to uh, to both zechariah and, and mary you might think oh angel i mean that's completely craziness right it's like fairy on top of the christmas tree craziness actually if there is a creator god then the miraculous things we see in the gospels aren't irrational to believe actually if you believe that god made the whole universe it's, it's not actually irrational to believe for example in the virgin birth so sort of set that aside because many of the greatest scientists in history and today do believe that there is a creator god so, so just to like set that piece of skepticism aside to sit down and read through one of the gospels and, and just ponder on who is this person and the, the second thing i'd say is it's easy for us to kind of compare Christianity with all its crazy beliefs to a perfectly coherent secular worldview that does all the work for us that Christianity does without us having to believe in crazy things. And the reality is there is no such belief system. Hmm. Uh, so don't think that by examining Christianity, you're sort of stepping off the cliff and, you know, potentially like leaping into some imaginary, I don't know, lifeboat that might be down at the bottom there. Hmm recognize that you are in fact here and that actually some of the top like atheist thinkers at the moment are open about the fact that you're you're kind of dangling here hmm. uh, and and consider whether actually you, you might be um yeah J jesus might actually be the, the most rational person to follow right now mm, right right you're off the edge of the cliff but repent turn around <laughs> there might be terra firma behind you um and I would add to that, um, get uh, Confronting Christianity, uh, 10 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion, and, and have a read, because it will take you on a journey through those questions um, and reveal to you increasingly uh, the beauty and the explanatory power and the glory of Jesus. So um, there's another thing that people can do. Rebecca McLaughlin, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Glenn.